Excellent. Sure about so about excellent. Okay, let's see. Okay, perfect. So it sounds like online people can hear me. Uh, what about in class people? Yeah, clearly you can hear me. Not as much of a tech a technological buffer between us. Uh, okay, so before I start today's lecture. I do want to just go ahead and uh, announce that next week we're actually going to be evaluated by uh, the ABET accreditors, uh, the, the, the ones responsible for our accreditation. And so one of the things that they want to do is kind of survey and interview pools of students from vast, diverse ba uh, academic backgrounds. And what I mean by that is they want to interview students who are full time. They want to interview students who are part time. They want to interview students who potentially uh, had uh, have transfer credits. They want to uh, into UNO, so they've gone somewhere else and they come here. They want to potentially interview students who have uh, started their academic career here at UNO. They'd like to go ahead and talk to students at the senior level. They like to talk to students at like the freshman or sophomore level. They'd like to talk to students who have had internships. They'd like to talk to students who don't have internships. They'd like to talk to students who are young. They'd like to talk to students who are older, or who have families. So the idea is they want to get a, a diverse set of experiences. So uh, I have a lot of volunteers from the higher end of the, uh, the program, but I would really advocate for you to be able to, uh, if possible, try to make it on Monday, uh, 4 p.m., and be part of like the the more introductory level of the uh, computer science interview process. And one of the cool things about this is that you actually have the opportunity to help shape what the curriculum looks like based off of your feedback. And so that puts you in a really good position because you still have a lot of the classes to tick. So you really have skin in the game because the accreditation board gives you the opportunity to voice whatever concerns or whatever things you'd want to see in the department. And then they lean on the department. They, they have to, they then go consult the department about implementing those changes. So this is actually your, your chance to affect change in the department. And so I highly recommend if you're, if you're available at that time, has that everyone gotten the email in terms of a, uh, in terms of being able to RSVP? For uh for that, you didn't get the email. It would have went out yesterday, I think. Double check. I just want to make sure this email got sent out. You got the email. Okay, so double check. It should be in the email to RSVP. Though it's super easy. It's uh, RSV. I'll I'll show you right here on my screen. It would be rsvp.cs.uno.edu. And here you'll you can answer some basic questions that effectively allow us to evaluate like the diversity of the students so that we can select as many of those different options they want us to be able to uh, to get for them to be able to communicate with. And so yes, please, 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 if you're at all possible, uh, try to be a part of that. I, Many years ago, when I went through the program, because I actually got my uh, computer science degree through UNO, I was actually part of that student interview process uh, a couple cycles ago. So now you could you could be a part of that too. Excellent. So, but yeah, they want to try to go ahead and uh, get about twenty people, uh, twenty different students, uh, to be a part of that, if possible. Okay, so you got it, perfect. Okay, so with that said, um, is there any questions about what we did last class or in lab, or I think, right, the, the test two is due at the end of the day tomorrow. So I'm assuming everyone's been working on that and not necessarily waiting all the way to the very end, right? Okay, perfect. Perfect. I'll take it by your silence that everyone has diligently been working on that for the last week or so. So I want to continue where we last left off. 
Tuesday. Okay, so on Tuesday, we started to talk about modeling a second thing. So the first thing we modeled as a demo of object-oriented design was an account, an ATM. I should be more specific. It was an ATM account object model where we built a class that had the properties for an ATM account and then the behaviors or the methods that supported the ATM account. Uh, and then those methods represented effectively that object's API, the way that we can interface and do things with that object inside of our software ecosystem. So then I challenged, uh, I think we did a challenge on talking about demoing a second thing inside of today's class. And that was, does anyone remember what that was? It was time, right? And we actually started to design out the, uh, I guess I should turn this on. We actually started to um, design out the UML diagram to represent time. So let me get our projector on. And so if you recall, our UML diagrams usually consist of a table that's three different rows, one column, three different rows, where at the very top row is going to be, and let's see here, Let's go on here. So we talked about modeling a time object and we, we said, suppose we want to model time in our software as an object model. The first thing we consult it with, and I think this is in the tail end of last lecture, is what would our UML class diagram look like? Before we ever start coding anything in Java, we think deeply on what it's, what's going to be available to us uh, in terms of properties and in terms of the, uh, public available methods or effectively the API of that object model. And so we start with these UML class diagrams and that allows us to think deeply on those two different other components, the fields and the methods that will be supported. And the fundamental data types in the fields can be things like other objects that we'll have to model in the future, or it could be collections of data or arrays. Or then it could be like the fundamental types, numbers, text, or booleans. And again, our behaviors or methods for those object, uh, the object's API in our ecosystem. So we had talked about this. We said we we're going to call this time. And then we, on the second row here in our UML diagram, we identified that if we were to model time, it would be made of three distinct properties. It would be an hour it would be a minute and it would be a second. And our hour, we decided in terms of the data type that we can use to encode a value to it, to model what an hour is, is an integer value. We decided we could also use an integer value to model a second and also an integer value to model a minute. So between those three distinct individual features of time, that represents enough to build a complete representation of time in and of itself. The same thing you'd have on a watch, uh, if you wore a watch still. Uh, and then the methods that we had identified was, well, we would need a constructor. We would need the ability to go ahead and convert the state of our time instance into a string, if for no other reason but to evaluate what it looks like so we can constantly inspect it while we're constructing, while we're building out while we're testing and validating that our code is working, uh, we decided that we needed some setter methods. Since they're private, we want to be able to set the time to be an hour or a specific minute or specific second. And here, actually, in this purpose, I do kind of want to do something slightly different than what we did last time. Uh, so there we go. I'm going to make these private because sometimes you have these private helper methods, but we're still going to want to verify that they work. So we'll have as a public method a set time that takes in a hour, which will be an int, a minute, which will be an int value, and then a second, which will be an int value. Perfect. And so when we go to build our tester, because when we start, when we get into the phase 
of moving past the design of our object and we start going into the implementation of this object model into a Java class, then we also alongside it want to build a tester so that we can test as we implement a method at a time just to ensure that our class implementation is correct based off of our expectations. Okay, so let's, so is there any questions in terms of this class diagram up, up to this point, this UML? Because now at this, at this, at, at this point, I'd like to start implementing our time class and actually go through the process of implementing this. So here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use this UML diagram as a basis to create a stubbed out implementation of our time class. So that's going to look something like this. And again, what I'll do initially is I'll copy it, but then we'll talk and break it down and discuss this. So let's go into here. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a time.java. I'm going to put this in here. Um, Okay. Okay, so here inside of our class now, we're going to start with public and I'll cut things out so that we can hyper focus on them. So I start with a class definition, public class time, public because this class has to be available to outside classes inside of our Java application and so outside software objects. Uh, class is just the top level keyword we use to start constructing classes. We've been using that all throughout the semester. Uh, the, the other alternate top level uh, keyword we've seen alongside that was enum, right? So here we'll give a name, the same name that we use at the top of our UML diagram. Okay, so then after that, the next thing I'm going to do is define the instance fields, these instance variables, where every new instance of time that we construct will have its own hour, its own minute, and its own second. And again, we always apply the private access level to our instance fields to ensure that only the class itself can read and write. And then if any external class desires access to either mutate or query the state of our time, then we provide that through public methods. And that allows us to control and manage what happens inside of each time instance. Because at this level of implementation, this is where we're going to think most deeply about this object model. And so we want to we want to abstract away all of that problem domain from every other object inside of our software system, inside the ecosystem of our software. And at the same time, we want to encapsulate, we want to hide all of what we're doing so that the only thing that external code needs to know about is that set of public methods that we make available. And so then the public, then the methods, the uh, client code will just expect that it can rely on our class to do anything that's time related. And then once I have that, the next thing I'm gonna do here is I'm going to take each one of those instance methods that are in the third row of my UML diagram, and I'm gonna stub those out into the class so that I know that they're there, that I don't forget about anything later on. So stubbing out just means I declare them, but I don't quite implement them yet. And by implement, I, I give it a method body, but I leave that method body empty. So it technically is a method that's defined in the class itself. However, it doesn't do anything when I execute it. Now, one caveat that you should recall is that so long as the return type is void, then we don't have to put any implementation in there. But if there's a return type where they expect a particular type of data to get returned, then we have to return a dummy value until we finally implement that method. 
Otherwise, our code won't compile. So for instance, if you look at uh, the two meridian method that returns a string or the two string method returns a string, both of these we're just going to return null as a dummy value so that our code is syntactically correct, so that it's legal for compilation purposes. And so the idea is we will slowly implement a class, uh, a method at a time inside this class, and we'll test until we are fully tested. We have full coverage of testing across all our methods, and then we're satisfied and we can move on. We would give this work to the lead developer who can then integrate this into the rest of the software project, and then other people can start using it. Okay, so at this point, let me make sure I've set time, I've set hour, I've set minute, I have set second, I have two meridian and two, uh, two strings. So let's test, let's verify that this works. I'm gonna do a Java C time and, oh, let's see what we got here. Time or only, uh, except, oh, I got to, there we go. Perfect. So now we, we were able to successfully compile. I see I have my, I have my doc class file here, so that's perfect. So it's not, it's not just enough now, as I stated earlier, for us to start building out our time class. It's super critical if we wanna do this, if we wanna do this the way that an engineer would approach this problem and not the way that just a common developer would approach this problem is that we test along the way. We validate and we verify. So the moment I create a time.java file, I'm going to create a corresponding time tester.java file that will explicitly be used as an application file to pass messages, to build instances and check that all of my general case and exceptional case uh, uh, logic works inside of my object model. So I don't want to wait until I build the rest of the application around this. I want to I want to test each class at a time, and not just a class at a time, a method within the class at a time. And a method is the single testable unit inside of our code base. Okay. Oh, cancel out. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a. So what our time tester will look like, again, just stubbed out, would look like this, where we will have a public class time tester. This will be a application file, which will build mock instances of our time for the explicit purposes of testing. So I will have a main method. Now recall that a main method should effectively be the general manager of your application. So my main method is going to call lots of helper methods that actually perform the testing. And then I'm gonna stub out each of those helper methods. We could say that I'm gonna have a helper method that's going to test the two string because before I can start doing anything else to validate and verify that my time class is implemented properly before I can test any other method, I need the ability to display the state of my time as text. Otherwise, there's, there's no way for me to peer inside to see what's happening. So the first thing I'll do then is test the two string to make sure it's working the way I expect. Then we'll test the setters. So I'll test setting the hour. I'll test setting the minute. I'll test setting the second. Once I am confident that those three setters work, I will test to meridian which is an alternate way of displaying time. So when I have two meridian, what does that mean to everybody? So we know what, so we have two string and two meridian. What do you think the difference is? That's right, exactly. So meridian time is AM. Uh, so technically that's what AM and PM stand for, right? Anti and post meridian. Meridian meaning the midway point. So noon of the day. So anti meridian is AM, Post meridian is PM. So there are two viable and valid ways 
that we can articulate and communicate time as a string, as, as, a, as a textual representation, and see they're in a universal state where we can just give the hours from a zero to 23, uh, to, from a scope from zero to 23, and then your minutes and your seconds, or you could do effectively uh, one to 12. Excellent, so we will test that. And then finally, we will test some constructors. So we'll talk about that as we start to implement, but yes, we'll, we'll talk about that as we start implementing and expanding out our functionality. So just like what we've strived to do in the past, which is break our code base down into modular pieces and test it a little bit down the way, right? Like this constant iterative approach of design a little, implement a little test, design, implement test. And it's like a circle that cycles back and back and back and back until you're complete. We're gonna do the same approach. And this is gonna help guide us on what we're implementing at any given time. So this is kind of like our roadmap to completion. And we, when, when we implement all of these testers and all of our testers say we've passed, then we've gotten to the end of our journey building out this class. This approach, by the way, is what's called test-driven development. Okay, so the first thing we should strive to do is now build that two-string method. So I'm looking at my tester. The first test method was to test the two-string. So let's talk about how we can actually implement that. Well, the two-string method should be super simple. I'm not even going to implement the constructor yet. So I'm going to rely on a default constructor. So one of the cool things about Java is if we're building a class, and if we don't implement a constructor, Java gives us a constructor by default. That And so a default constructor just initializes a new instance of that class for us, but it doesn't set, and it, it uses default values to set all the instance variables. Well, let's see what that, that is. Let's go to the instance variables. What are the instance variables inside of our uh, time class? I'll actually go into the actual code. Oh, I should also make my time tester class as well. So let, let me do that. Let me make my time tester class. And then we'll talk about the, um, finish talking about the default constructor. Oops, well, we'll just get rid of this. Okay, and let me get the stubbed out implementation of this so that, oh, no, not that. Okay, no. Oh. So, okay, so now we have our implementation here. It's just our main method and then each of our helper methods. Perfect. Let me save that. Okay, so the first thing we said we're going to do is we're going to start implementing this two string method. So instead of return null, we're actually going to return an implementation. Now, two string method is an instance method, it means we're going to need a a class, uh, an instance of the class in order to make calls on it. Now, what you've seen when we first started designing our ATM account class was that we explicitly created constructors from the get-go. Here, I'm gonna rely on a default constructor. So like I said earlier, if I don't define the constructor, if I don't explicitly create a constructor method inside of my class, Java automatically adds one for us. But all it does is create new instances in the response to the new keyword, hold on to the class. So it doesn't have any logic to say how it should set the instance fields, the instance variables. Recall that what a role, what the responsibility of the constructor method is, is to construct an instance. And that means it has all the logic of what a newly constructed instance's instance features, its, its instance properties, its instance variables, what values they should have. So if I'm relying on a default constructor, what do you think the value of R is going to be? By default. So when we create an integer value, it has to have a value by default, right? Before we set it, it has a default value. What do you suppose the default value of that is? Yeah, exactly. So for numerical data, these are both value from the get-go is zero. That's true for doubles, floats, and longs. So if I rely on the default constructor to construct an instance, since all three of my instance properties are integers, 
then all of them will start as zeros. They will exist and they will have the default value of zero. So let me extend that further though. What do you suppose the default value of a Boolean is? Exactly, it's, it's gonna be false. What do you suppose the default value of a string is? No, exactly. There's no reference yet, a null reference, because anything that is a reference data type, remember what a reference data type means, it's some memory address somewhere else. If we haven't created a memory address of something somewhere else, then it's a null reference, or what we just referred to as null. Okay. So with that said, that allows us before creating an explicit constructor where we can start testing things out. So we're gonna kick that can of building explicit constructors all the way to the end of this process. So let's go down and look at the implementation. The two string method is probably one of the simplest to implement, right? Because all it's going to do is worry about the logic of expressing the state of our instance as text. So let me jump. So I'm gonna replace this line here from null to I'm going to return a string. So the return type is string. And so I personally love one of the static methods in the string class called dot format. because I really like formatted uh, um, strings. I like formatted print statements as well because it gives me a lot of control over say for instance, the amount of precision points I wanna express inside of a uh, double, for instance, or it gives me a lot of control on how I can represent the text in terms of spacing. So here, I'm gonna start with a formatted uh, uh, string. So recall with the formatted strings, I first start with a string literal, that means it uses double quotations. Inside, I can put placeholder values, percent D is the placeholder value for an integer data type, the D represents a decimal integer data type. So a base 10 number is what decimal means, as opposed to binary, which is a base two number, hexadecimal, which is a base 16 number, octal, which is a base eight number. All of these number bases you will get experience with at some point throughout this curriculum. Okay, so here I'm going to have percent D, which is going to then line up with the hour. So the first thing that'll print out is the hour, followed by a colon. And then I have percent D here. And what do you suppose, just to evaluate, just to make sure everyone understands what's happening, what is happening with the zero two in between the percent D? So the percent D represents the placeholder value. Recall, I can get formatting instructions between the percent sign and then the data type that that placeholder represents. In this particular instance, what do you think that zero two represents? That's absolutely correct. Zero two, the two says it has to be two digits. So if the digit was singular, like say for instance, a single zero, then it will force it to be two digits and the zero that appears before the two is what the fill value is. So if it's only a singular digit, fill the other spot with a zero in front of it. So preface it with a zero. And that's what we do on clocks, right? On clocks, you can have a singular one for the hour, but there's always two digits for the minute. So we want to represent the same kind of string we'd expect to see on a clock and pre-fill that value, even if it's a zero, so that it's forced to be two digits large. Perfect. And then here, I'm gonna do another colon. So obviously the delimiter between my hours, my minutes and seconds are colons, pretty common. And so the third value also is gonna put a zero two between the percent and D because we wanna ensure that our seconds are always two digits, even if it's being represented by a singular digit and prefixed with a zero, well, we want that prefix to also show. So a representation then of our time here should be something that looks like, say for instance, one colon zero zero colon zero zero. And that would be one o'clock effectively in the morning, right?
Okay, so with that said, is there any questions with this implementation up to this point? Well, then the next thing we would do is we would actually test this out. And so here, what I'm going to do to test this out is I'm going to go into that test two string method that I've already stubbed out in my tester. And now I'm actually going to start building some test implementation. So let me copy this here, all of the yellow is what's new inside of the slide. So if you use this for a reference, it'll be kind of meaningful and not overwhelming. Let me go into here, but let's actually, I, I like to actually run the code and not just look at it. So I'm gonna paste what's in there and I'm gonna go line by line just to make sure everyone knows what's happening here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to declare two string variables. By the way, is this the first time we've seen that we can declare multiple variables on one line? It's possible to actually, so if both your variables are of the same data type, I can claim string and then do a comma separated list for each variable of that type I want to declare. So here I'm going to create two string variables, one that's labeled has the identifier of actual and the other that will be labeled as expected. Then I'm gonna create a new time instance and I'm going to invoke the default constructor. So recall, we haven't implemented an explicit constructor, but Java gives us one if we haven't done that. And so it gets invoked every time the new keyword is prefaced with the constructor method. And then I will get back from the JVM a newly built instance of time. So every time instance has all of the instance variables. So in this instance of time, there's three instance properties. There's still three instance variables. It's the hour, the minute, and the second. And since we're using the default constructor, it'll have the default value for each of those uh, variables. So the time should be zero. Uh, I mean, the hour should be zero, the minute should be zero, and the second should be zero. So then what we're going to do then is for the actual string, we're going to invoke that two string method, the one we just implemented, and we're going to save that into actual. And then for expected, we should expect that the default value of time as represented as a string should look like this, right? So a singular digit for the hour, two digits for the minute, two digits for the second, colons in between as our delimiter, between our minute second. Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to compare the expected value to the actual value, which means it's either going to be true or false. If my actual value is equal to what I expect it to be here, then I'm going to display inside of this print statement I have this string where I'm in the brackets illustrating what tester method I am in. So I'm in the two string tester method. And then what test number I'm on, sometimes you wanna test multiple cases. You might test a general case, but you should also test each exceptional case. We're gonna look at that in just a moment. And then we're gonna put, we're gonna report whether we passed or failed that test. If we failed that test, this is a great opportunity for us to re-examine the two-string method and try to figure out why did we fail. And if we pass the test, then that means that it performs the way we expect it to, and we can move on to the next method. I have a question. Yes. Why is the hour just denoted by one when the minutes could be denoted by one as well as the seconds? Why isn't the hour also denoted by two? Well, that's a great question. And I would, and, and this is a modeling thing, but let me ask you if the following is valid or not. So we know that this is valid as a time, right? So, and here, let me do this. Is this valid? Okay. Then let me ask, is this valid? And then let me ask, 
is this valid? So, and this is a subjective process, by the way. This is subjective. So this is based off of what we want the behavior to be. But then it's super important that we create a comment that defines that this is the expected behavior. So look at the first, can everyone see the first value? Do I have to enlarge this at all? Is that better? So here I have two digits for the hour, two digits for the minutes, and two digits for the seconds. But now let's compare these two. Which one, so it's this versus this. So this is an instance here where I have a singular distance, uh, a singular digit for the hour versus forcing the hour to have two digits. Which one is commonly expressed for time, for clocks? Do you normally see what's on the left-hand side or do you normally see what's on the right-hand side? The left hand, right? Isn't it pretty common that we actually don't prefix the hour with a zero? Now, it's not to say we couldn't do this, but if our aim is to model what a wristwatch might display, it's probably more in line with the left hand side than the right hand side. E e either of them could be valid, though, but we make that, dis that decision at this point. While we're defining this model, this method, I'm sorry, this method, and when we make that decision, we should make a comment to express that that is the desired behavior. Does that answer your question? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, And at this point, there's no real way for us to set the time to anything else. So this will be the only thing that we test it on just to make sure it's displaying the way we expect. This one right here. So what's happening on line 13 is that this is an assignment operation. It's not just an assignment operation, this is an initialization operation. So we're doing a declaration and an assignment of the same line. So whenever we do that, we always read the right-hand side of the uh, assignment operator before we do the assignment because we have to resolve into a value and that value then gets uh, assigned into a, a variable. So on the right-hand side of this assignment operation, I'm using the new keyword. The new keyword is always paired with the constructor method to create a new instance of something. Now I haven't explicitly defined a constructor method. But one thing Java will always do, if we don't explicitly design, uh, define a uh, constructor method, one is implicitly created for us. So there's, a, so there's a hidden constructor where all it does is it builds a instance of time that has, that contains all of the instance properties. So if I go back into time, each instance of time would have these three properties an hour instance variable, a minute instance variable, and a second instance variable. And since all three of those are integers, the default constructor would assign to them the default value that an integer can have when it's initially created, which is zero. So that means at the end of this, this resolves down to be a time instance. So every time instance has three inner variables that represent each of its model properties, each of its, its individual things that it has, hour, minute, seconds, then I can then save that. Now, since this is a more, this is a reference data type now, this is now, we've built a user-defined type at this point. So when we first started the semester, we were learning how to use all the primitive data types. Now we're learning how to make our own data type. The data type that we've created is of the time data type. So when I create a variable, I have to use the data type that I'm going to store into that variable. And now I'm going to use time, the actual class we've created as a valid data type for this variable. And then the T1 could be anything. I just called it T1 in case I want to make a T2 or a T3 or T4, right? Because it's not uncommon when you start testing things out where you want to create different instances of things. Uh, here, I just create the one instance though. And then, so by the time this line is done, I will now have a reference in memory to a time instance 
that I can refer to as T1. So anytime I, I use T1, access T1, I can then call those methods that are defined as instance methods within this class. So one of the instance methods and the only one we've implemented up to this point is the two string method, this one right here. And so that's the one I actually want to test and my test two string. So then on that T1, that's going to have three instance properties. When it two strings it, it's going to then represent it as a string that should look like this. And we'll actually test that and see if that works. And in fact, let's actually see if that works. Let's uh, compile my time tester, which it compiled fine. And now let's let's run this time tester. And we'll see that I do get a printout here and my printout shows that the two string, I was testing two string, test one for two string, pass true. That means that my expected and my actual were equal, which means that I can move on, right? That my implementation matches my expectation. Okay, does anyone have questions up to this point? Did, did that answer your question? Does everyone see the value of testing before we move on in our code base? Well, so we could do this one of two ways. We could of we could have printed the time and personally inspected it. But what we want to start doing is thinking of how to automate that process. So instead of putting us the responsible role of displaying the state and then saying, hey, is this right or wrong? I want the application to do that evaluation for me, right? So I wanna take that work off of me, the developer, and I want whoever goes to run and execute my time tester just to see if my test passed or failed without them having to make the decision whether the, time, the test uh, passed or failed. So the idea is, this is one of the really useful things about why we build these tester classes. This might seem like a lot of extra work to you right now, right? Like you're like, well, I'm building this class and then I'm building this tester and I'm going to test against all these things. Well, it's going to, it does, it has a number of really good benefits as to why you should always do this. The first is while you're designing and implementing each method, it's forcing you to consider all the possible outcomes, right? So you're thinking, well, what if I pass this value to it? What if I pass this other value? Like what should the result be? So you're thinking as deeply as possible on each unique unit problem for each thing that could happen for every given method in, a, in an object. So by the time you're done, you've thought about it so well that if something goes wrong, well, so nothing should go wrong with it. So it's a way of making your class as valid and correct. So we're, we're evaluating it for correctness. But there's a value even beyond when you initially create it. When you go to share this class with someone else, when you go to give your time class to another developer, or more importantly, the project lead, you can also give them the tester class that they can run, and then they can see how to use that class in practice. It's used as a proof of concept of these are all the different methods that are publicly available inside of this class, and here's a demo of how they're all used. And so instead of other people who, uh, who might have to just read the API and play around with your code, you're giving them a playground. You're giving them sample code. You're giving them a demo of everything this class can do. So then when they start building out their own code, you're giving them an actual implementable guide. And that is invaluable. Because wouldn't you like to have that yourself when you start using someone else's code, not just the API, just not the Java files, but also some sample code that you can compare and use to model for your own use case. And so again, that's the really big, awesome thing about providing these testers. It forces you to think deeply about all the outcomes that can happen with your methods, but it also provides a implemented guide so everyone else can see how your methods are supposed to work, how they would, how they could violate what your methods expect and see what exceptions might occur with them. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, let's see here. 
So let's move on then. So, oh, not there. Let's move on then to the, uh, so here, I've already done this, right? I've already executed this, but every time we now go ahead and implement one of these test methods in our tester file, we want to compile and execute. And again, this is what's called test-driven development. I build out my test. I think about how I want to test, and then I run that on my on my object, I build an instance and I evaluate, and then I keep doing that in this test-based cycle. And so we consider all the general cases and all the exceptional cases while working on our methods. So once it's done, we can move on and feel confident that it will work in our system, uh, the, 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 the ecosystem of our software is intended. And so this process of ensuring the integrity, the accuracy, the robustness, and the full tolerance of your software object is what will separate you as a software engineer versus a software developer, versus someone who just hacks together code. So when you hear software engineering and you're like, well, what's the difference? It's these, it's these design principles, these testing principles, where you're constantly striving for uh, uh, to verify the validity and the correctness of your code base before delivering it to someone else. Okay, so the next thing we should strive to do is let's implement uh, our set hour. Now, before we can implement our set hour, recall we made those private. Look, let's go back and, and double check that. Here, notice my set hour is private, my set a uh, minute is private, my set second is private. That means nothing outside of the class can actually call these directly. Now, now, if I want my tester method to actually test set hour, I need a public method to call on the instance that can actually do that. So I'm gonna create also this set time method that is public. And what the set time method will do will be to call set hour and set minute and set second. So let's implement that. And so we can see that's all it's doing. So it's just kind of passing the buck along. Right, so here, set time is gonna set call the hour. And set, so right now, this doesn't do anything still. We're calling methods, it executes those methods, but those methods have an empty body, but that's fine. Because now the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna implement set hour. What are, now when we go to implement set hour, recall at this level, as we implement a method at a time, we have to go ahead and make decisions about what is valid and what's not that gets passed in. So let's, let's think about this before we take a look at the slide. When we go to set the hour, we're gonna pass in an integer value. Now recall that integers represent, they model a hour. But the question is, does every, value of integer map to a valid legal representation of an hour? Or is it scope? Is there a smaller scope of integer values that properly represent an hour versus every possible integer value? So what, what's the scoping? What, are, what is an example of an integer value that would be illegal to use as an hour value? 25 is one, zero, zero, well, zero would actually be legal. You actually have zero hundred hours, but a negative value, anything less than zero would be illegal. So we have a scope. It has to be at least zero. And let me think about this. Let's think back to standard time, universal time. Let's think of universal time, also sometimes referred to as military time. You have zero hundred hours. What time is zero hundred hours? Yeah, so, so that's effectively midnight, right? Or, or what we would say in meridian time is midnight. So what would be 12, the 12th hour at zero minutes, zero seconds AM would be the equivalent of 0,100 hours. Okay, so if 0,100 is a valid hour, what's the maximal hour? First of all, how many hours are in a day? So we are going to recycle after you have 24 countable hours. Well, what is the last countable hour if the first countable hour starts with a zero? 23, right? So that means 2,300 hours is 11 p.m. And you go from 2,300 hours to 0, 0,100 hours because you're going to loop back over, right? 
Okay. So with that said, we have identified general cases and exceptional cases. Exceptional cases in this instance is we want to prohibit an integer that is less than zero and greater than 23 from being set as the hour, right? Because those represent valid integer values, but illegal values to model an a, a hour properly. And so we look for the exceptional cases. And if they occur, we throw that illegal argument exception so that we alert client code, hey, you violated what we consider the model of an hour. So that would look like this, right? If the hour is less than zero or the hour is greater than 23, then we will throw this new illegal argument exception. And then we pass a message whenever we construct those new instances. So here, let's implement this. And make sure all my formatting's in. And so if we don't fall into one of these exceptional cases, right, where the integer is valid, but it's not legal, then we set it. If it's both legal and valid, we set it. If it's, if it's valid, but not legal, we throw the exception, an illegal argument exception. Okay, so now after we implement this, we want to test. However, we don't want to test, we want to test the general case. So let's pass something that we think is valid. But then we also want to uh, test the two exceptional cases. There's two exceptional cases. We want to test if the value we pass is less than zero, and we want to pass to see if it's greater than 23 just to make sure it's going to produce the behavior we expect it to. So the way that I could do this is inside of my test hour method, I'm going to set up the data I need. So I'm going to create a string that's actual, another string that's expected. I'll create a Boolean value that is my test, the result of my test. Then I'm going to create a new instance of time calling the default constructor. Then I'm going to call that set time method. Remember, that's the public method that's available. And it can take three parameters. The only one that we want to care about right now, and the only one that's implemented is the set hour one. So that's going to be the first of the parameters. So here I'll set the hour to be 12. So that would be noon. And then I'll set zero, zero, right? Both of those I'll set as default because I have to have three values past the set time. Then I'm going to call the two string method because that's how we can inspect the state as a string. So we can see if it actually has the value of 12. And I'll, I'll save that string from my two string method to the actual. Then my expected value after I set should be 1200 hours, right? It should be 12 colon zero zero colon zero zero. Then I'll test to make sure that my expected value is equal to my actual value. And then I'll print out the value of this test. But that's test one. It's only part of the testing because it's possible that I can have eval invalid uh, uh, values that, oh, I'm sorry, illegal values that are passed in. So the next thing, the next way I would want to test this is to check to see if those exceptions are being thrown. So I'm going to make a try catch block. Inside the try catch block, I'm going to try to set to one of those illegal values. I'm going to try to pass the value of minus one. And I'm going to expect to catch an illegal argument exception. Inside, inside that illegal argument exception, I'm going to get the message, the one that I passed in, which should be hours must be between zero to 23. And I'm gonna save that into my actual variable, the one that was declared all the way at the top here. Then I'm going to set my expected string to be hours must be between zero and 23. And I'm gonna see if I did get that message back. And I'm going to check and print out the result of that test here as my test two. And then finally, I'm gonna test for the other side of that exception. I'm gonna to try to set the hour to 24. And I'm gonna expect that that should also throw an exception. I'm gonna get the message from that exception. I'm gonna get the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reset my expected string message to be what I expect it to be. And I'm gonna evaluate, I'm gonna compare, is the expected message equal to the actual message?
And then I'm gonna uh, show the results of that here. So let's go ahead and implement this. And if anyone has any questions, let me know. Otherwise, we will test this and move on. Okay. So we have our testing code. And then what I would do is I would compile. I would run my tests. And here, uh-oh, look at this. I have my test hour false and false in terms of passing. So let's see what's happening here inside of our implementation. So here, if the hour is less than zero or the hour is greater than 23, then hour must be between zero and 23. Oh, and look at here. The problem is that the message is not accurate, right? This says hours with a plural. Let's remove that and make sure we pass our test. Now, all the more reason why we want to check that all of our testing is correct. And now we see that this is true. The same is true on line 43 as it was on line 34. So we will update that. We will compile. And now we pass all the tests, which lets me know, OK, both exceptional cases and general cases for set hour seem to work the way I expected to. It's time for me to move on to the next method. Mm -hmm. So in the E here, so when we go to catch an exception, we're going to see this later on in the semester when we get into exceptions, we could potentially have multiple exceptions to get thrown within the same method, right? So imagine I had an illegal argument exception, but suppose I also had an array inside that method that could uh, throw an array out of bounds exception. So those are two different exception objects. So this here lets me declare what type of exception object that I actually want to try to catch and not just catch every exception. And then the E that follows it is simply a variable name. So I, call, I could call it E. I could have also called it IAE as well. I could have called it exception. I could have called it just X if I wanted to. It's just a label. I'm just wondering if you wanted to write in the code the difference between the choice of universal military time and standard time. Would you write that in two separate classes? Would you write that inside that method of time? Would you write that as a case switch? What would be your method of well, writing so that? I, I would write different methods that actually display based off of the name. So the default value that we've selected is the universal value where it doesn't mutate the state in any way, it just displays it as the set that the, the value of the hour, the minute, and the second. And then we've created a separate method that we haven't implemented yet that's called two meridian that will display the state of our time as an expression of an AM or PM format. And if you have other expressions that you want your time to be displayed as, you could probably create a method that does that. So the idea is that you want to encapsulate that unit of logic inside of a method. And you want to give that method a really good verbose name so people know to use that method to get that kind of behavior. Does that make sense? So the answer is you'd write another method. Exactly. Yeah, the answer is always whenever you want more functionality from a object, you write a method, a public method to do that. And then your public methods show up as the API documentation that all other client code could read and know how to perform those tasks on your object or how to perform those requests even. I think that's a better accurate term for that. So you could think of the, the collection of methods that a object has, public methods that an object has as the set of requests that someone can uh, have it perform. So you can request for it to set the hour. You can request for it to set the minute. You can request for it to set the second. You can request for it to be expressed as meridian time. You can request for it to be expressed as standard time, which is the two-string method. So these are all requests that we ask for the instance to perform for us. When do you make the decision between writing another method or a class? Like we uh, do in the so homework. The, so a class should model 
a object. So and when I'm designing my homework, uh, or if I'm designing an application, I think of the different constituent parts that might make it up. Like for instance, I might need a UNO student. I might need a UNO faculty member. I might need a, a grade roster, right? I might need uh, a uh, account. And so all of these are individual objects that then can pass information to one another through a message passing scheme through uh, which is a method call. So the way that one object interacts with another object is for it to call its methods. And what I mean by that is if I go back to my time tester here, inside my time tester, this is a class in and of itself, and it interacts with the time class by building instances of time and then tallying or requesting the time instance to do thing by calling a method. So each method is a request that that instance can now perform. And so I make that, that instance as feature rich, I give it as many methods as it needs to have to do its job. But one of the distinctions between a method, which is like a action and a class, which represents a collection of properties and methods is gonna be just that. So like for instance, time has this idea that, well, time can be confined as a set of properties. Those properties are hours and minutes and seconds. And then there's behaviors, there's requests I want to do to those time properties. Those requests are modeled as my methods. So you decide to do a new class if you can define a set of properties and a set of methods or requests on those properties. I select just to do a method if I already have those set of properties defined in the class and I just wanna add more logic to do something with it. But again, we, what we try to do is we don't want to violate the dry principle and create a lot of duplicated classes that have a lot of the similar fields. Actually, we're going to see how we can start building inheritance hierarchies so that we can actually start using classes and deriving new classes from them. We're not there yet. We'll be talking about that next week. Okay, let's move on. Let's, let's finish out building out our, uh, our setters. So the next thing that we would do is we're going to talk about how to implement our set minute. And here, when we go to implement our set mi uh, minute, we're going to make the same considerations we did with set hour. We know that we could pass in any integer value. So at this time, while developing this method, we want to decide, well, what's a, what is a legal value for this integer and what's an illegal value. And we wanna check for the illegal values and we wanna throw an illegal argument exception with the appropriate uh, method name. In fact, let me go back over here just to make sure that that is perfect. So I don't, and so that the code's correct. Okay, so here I'm gonna to check to see when minute is less than zero or if minute is greater than 59, we're gonna throw an illegal argument exception where the minute must be between zero and 59. And if it, isn't, and if it isn't one of those exceptional cases, then we assume it's valid, it is legal, and then we'll set the minute that was passed into the parameter to our instance variable. So here, let's go into our time and we're gonna update the stubbed implementation with this actual implementation. Perfect. And then the next thing we do is we test and we're gonna test the same way we set, we did with our test hour. We're gonna test with the general case, and then we're gonna test against each of those exceptional cases. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up the date I need to test. So I'm gonna create a string that represents the actual state and the expected state. I'm gonna create a Boolean value to evaluate the result of a test. And then I'm gonna create an instance of time using the default constructor. And so initially to test that it's valid, I'm gonna set, as the middle parameter, which is my minute parameter, the value of 30. And then what I'll do is I'll two string that and my expected result should look like this. So there's a zero value in hours because I'm not, I'm not testing hours. There is a 30 where the minutes are at. And then finally that there's a zero value for seconds. So then I'm going to go ahead and I will see if my expected string equals my actual string, and I will print the result of that test here. But I also want to test those exceptional cases. So I'm going to create a try catch block. And then inside the try, I'm going to try to set 
the time to a negative value, to negative 30. And that should result in an illegal argument exception. So I'm going to try to catch that. And I'm going to grab the message. And I'm going to save that into the actual variable. And then I'm going to override the expected variable with the message I expect it to be. And so here, I think it should just be minute, right? Not minutes. Let's not make the same mistake we made last time, right? This said here, when we were um, implementing it, yep, just a singular minute. And then we're going to compare those and we're going to give the result of that as my test two. And then what we're going to do is we're going to test to see if we try to set it higher than 59. So we're going to set minutes to 60. We're going to expect that an illegal argument exception is going to get thrown. So we're going to get catch it and we're going to get the message from that compared to the expected message which is minutes must be between zero to 59. We're going to compare those and then we're going to test that out as the result of our um, as our result of test three. So then here, I'm going to go to my time tester. I'm going to replace the stubbed out implementation of test minute with now this much more verbose one. Let's make sure that we have, there we go, no. Oh. Let's make tab that. Oh Lord, all this is up. Oh, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, so just making sure everything is in alignment. I am a stickler for keeping my formatting correct. Okay, so let's save this. Let's now clear my console. I will compile and I will run my tester again. And here I'm going to say, oh, let's make sure that. These tests here don't have the plural of minutes. So here, yep, it does. So let's make that say minutes and let's make this say minute and not minutes. Let's compile, let's run. And now I see all of my tests are now true, which means I can move on and I can now consider the next method inside of the pool of methods that I want to implement in my time class. So the next one after testing is going to be set second. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to say I can take in an integer value that models a second. I have to identify when is it legal and when is it in, uh, illegal. So a second is illegal if it's less than zero or if it's greater than 59. On those instances that that might happen, I'm going to throw an illegal argument exception where we pass the message second must be between zero to 59. And if it's if it's not an exceptional behavior, then we're going to assume it's a general behavior. So let's go here and actually implement our set second. And so after implementing it, we're going to test it the same way that we've been doing uh, before. So here, no. So in order to test this inside the test second method, in my time tester, I'm going to set up the initial data I need, a string that represents the actual state, a string that represents the expected state, and a Boolean value for the results of each test. I'm going to create a new instance of time. I'm going to call set time, but this time I'm only going to pass a meaningful value as the third parameter, the one that sets the seconds. I'm going to set it to 30, and then I'm going to see if my expected value of 0, colon, 0, 0, colon, 0, I mean, uh, colon, 3, 0, is equal to what I actually get back from the two-string method. And if it is, then I pass test one. Then I'm going to test the exceptional cases. I want to test, well, if I do pass in a value that is less than 0, does it throw an illegal argument exception? So I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to get the exception. I'm going to save the message from that exception into the actual. And then I'm going to express the exception I expect it to be, which should just be second, not the plural. And then here, I'm going to do the same thing to test if I try to pass it to be greater than 59. So let's go and for our tester then, and replace our tester, our stubbed out implementation with this actual implementation. Let's save this. Let's clear. Oh, thank you. I don't know where I... uh, let's see, what line number? 95. Oh, thank you. Okay, perfect. 
And we'll make sure that that's the message we have here. Yep. So super important that we actually test the appropriate correct thing. Okay, so now let's run our tester and we can see we pass all the seconds. So now we can set hours, we can set minutes, we can set seconds all correctly. So at this point, we would be able to move on from mutating the state and starting to encode the next, the next set of logic we'd want, which is going to be to effectively implement my uh, meridian time. So let me implement this one last method and the next class we'll talk about explicit constructors. So this one's relatively simple. It's very similar to the two string method, but we are going to make some decisions on how we're going to express it. So here, notice I'm going to use string.format and what we do to exp express our time as a meridian value is we're still gonna have the hours and we're still gonna use colons as delimiters. So the hour is still only gonna be uh, one digit or two digits. It doesn't necessarily be get prefixed. So that looks the same. Now, in terms of the formatted string, the minutes look the same, right? It's just a prefix value. It's, it's going to be a value that's prefixed to guarantee that it's two digits. And then we still use a colon and then it's the same thing with seconds. So, so far, the only difference between my formatted string is gonna be right here, where I have a percent S where it could represent an AM or PM value. So here, the way that I can perform this is the meridian time is expressed as a modulus 12. So by default, we thought of time as being modulus 24, right? When you get to the 23, when you get to hour 23, you go back to hour zero. But if you divide things in half, so that you have one to 12 as effectively before noon, and then one to 12 after noon, and then you have your AM, PM, you could take whatever the hour is, modify 12. If it's zero, then you set it to 12. Because normally your 12 mod 12 is zero, right? Or zero mod 12 is zero. But both those instances at zero hundred hours or at 12 o'clock, you want that to be a 12 value. And since we're modding it by 12, every other value is going to be either 1 to 11. So what we could then take is we could just take whatever the hours is and mod it by 12. So if it's 1,300 hours, 13 mod 12 is 1, right? 14 mod 12 is 2. 15 mod 12 is 3. So this will define the hour we want. We keep minutes and seconds the same. And then to determine whether it's AM or PM, we just look at hours. If it's less than 12, then it's AM. If it's 12 or higher, it's PM. It's that easy. So let me go ahead, implement this. We'll, we'll test it and then we'll be done today. So here, let's put this in here. And now let's test this implementation. So to test this implementation, we're gonna go into our test to Meridian method. We'll set up the necessary data we need. So a string that represents the actual state, a string that represents our expected state, a Boolean value that represents our test result. And then we'll create an instance of time. Then we'll set our time to, well, we set our time to zero, zero, zero. That's the default value. We'll call two Meridium on it and we'll see if we get midnight, right? 12, zero, zero AM. And then we'll test our actual value to our expected value. And then what we'll do is we'll set our time to 2,300 hours. We'll do two meridium on that and see if that's not 11 p.m. So let's go ahead and test this. Let's grab this. Let's go into our tester. And I'm going to replace my test two meridian here with this tester here. Let's make sure that that's formatted correctly. Let me clear my terminal. Let me compile. Oh, does it not like? Um, I know what it does not like. We need hour, minute, second, hour, hour. There we go. We need to use the appropriate names for our instance variables. Okay, perfect. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to run our tester. And here we see that to test Meridian on test one, it did show midnight, 12 a.m. at 0, 0 hours. And at 2300 hours, it did go ahead and pass true for 11 p.m. 
So we've effectively built a really, a pretty well-defined version of time that's been engineered appropriately and, and has been tested, fully qualified and tested. So next class, I wanna talk about adding uh, explicit constructors and actually what it means to override constructors where I can have more than one constructor defined in a class. And that's what we're gonna do with our time class. So before I, uh, I uh, end class for the week, is there any questions related to this or do we feel kind of good about where we're going with this? Uh, so you were talking about the dot operator. So dot operator always means that the thing on the right hand side of the dot is contained within the thing on the left hand side of the dot. So so the dot operator allows me to access, say, for instance, in this instance, let me go to my time tester. So there's this set time method that exists inside of the time class. If I want to call the method inside the class, I use the dot operator. The dot operator allows me to access the method that is scoped in that class. You could think of it in terms of OS level as a slash. You know how if you have a directory inside of another directory and then a files inside of that, you use a delimiter of slash to represent the nesting structure, where our nesting structures are delimited using dots because slashes represent division inside of Java. Does that make sense? Excellent. If that's the only question, great day. I'll see everyone uh, next week.